So I'm here in my second video uh, for the day with the lovely Marion Todd, who is the writer of the Claire Mackay books sat, it set, set in um, St Andrews. Uh, Marion and I have been friends for quite a while now, actually. Um, so I thought it'd be really fun for us to have uh, a chat about writing books set in Scotland and police procedurals and all things writing. So Marion, your most recent book out is... A Blind Eye, is that That's right? That's right, yes. I had to think there for a minute what it was as well. Yep, A Blind Eye came out on the 8th of June. And is that book eight? Am I right in thinking that was book eight? No, that's book seven. Book seven, okay. Yeah, I've probably been going on about book eight because I've been editing it. And you know what it's like, you've always got, you're promoting one book, you've got your eye on the next one. Um, So that, so A Blind Eye is book seven. Book seven. And um, so Claire has been so she she came into this 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 your series already part of the way through her journey so coming to St Andrews for her yeah. was like kind of like a, a turning point in her career yeah that's right yeah I had written a book before the very first one that was published um that will never be published I mean I'm sure that every author alive has got a book buried in a hard disk or in a drawer somewhere that um is never going to see the light of day and this one never will and this book told Claire's backstory that she came from um, a force in Glasgow where she had been um, kind of trying to start afresh after a firearms incident. She'd been a firearms officer where she'd shot and killed um, a 15-year-old lad who'd been aiming to shoot her. And it was only after um, the inquiry and all the rest of it that, that she learned that the gun that the 15-year-old had was a replica. He was never going to be a threat. But she was exonerated because of the circumstances and she came to St Andrews for a clean break. So I had written that book. Um, and when I decided that I needed to start again with a, another book, um, I dripped a little bit of that backstory into the first one that's called See Them Run. And occasionally I'll make a reference to it if there's some reference to Claire's history. Um, it comes back again in book three, Lies to Tell. But um yeah, I just I wanted her to be someone who was having a complete fresh start. And the reason I kind of did or one of the reasons I did that was because it then let me introduce the reader to the area and how things worked in the station, because Claire was having to ask people. So instead of having to do a big info dump about St. Andrews and um, how things were done in the station. I would have Claire suddenly, where's that again? Or that that kind of thing. Um, so it, you know, it from a plot device, it was quite a useful thing to do. Yeah, I I, I love the way that you kind of get like snippets of Claire's, Claire's history. And I think that it's not just her professional history. You kind of get that feeling into her personal life as well. It's a tricky thing though, isn't it? Because you write a yeah. series and, it's it's a difficult balance knowing how much of the old stuff do I put in so yeah. that people who read the series from start to finish don't think, oh, I've heard all this before. Why is she telling me this again? So it, it I don't know. Do, do you find that? Do you think it's... Yeah, I find it really hard sometimes when I am, um, I'm trying to relate back to something that happened. So maybe Rowan's trying to make a point about what she's done or what she's capable of. But I don't want to be like, and then this happened, and this happened, this happened. So I'll make little references to things. And I kind of think it's enough for someone to go, oh, that must have happened in a previous book. Mm -hmm. But it's not enough to be distracting to this book. And yeah. if they come into the series um, at book three, they'll have like a little bit of a, a hint mm -hmm. and, and probably is a bit enough of a, if they could go back and read book one and it wouldn't be too much of a spoiler, but certainly... I don't, like you say, you've got to be really careful that you're not just repeating things because sometimes yeah. like I, I'm a big reader of series as well. And so I'm always looking for how well people do mm -hmm. those things or, you know, how I think, oh, I, God, I, I, we, we get this bit of the story every time. So I think it's really it's a really tricky path to follow because you do want someone to come into the series mm -hmm. at any point um, and not be lost and not and, and it not be an inside joke. Or and story. also read them out of sequence as well, because yeah. the more books you have, the more likely it is that, that somebody will not read them from one to four or one to six or whatever. Yeah, to be honest, I'm bad for that. The only time I really ever read a series from the start is when I get in on the ground floor. So I read mm -hmm. your series from the beginning because I was there from the beginning. But like um, I read a lot of Kate Ellis books, her mm -hmm. D.I. Wesley Patterson, and I read them in just any random order. So 
I, I and I get that from her sometimes there's bits where you think oh I'm not sure like I'm I was aware of this but that just a little reminder because you can dip in and out but I think that is quite tricky do you think with hindsight um now that you've written your fourth book um that you would go back and change anything um because of how the series has developed is there anything you think I wish I hadn't done that um that's maybe an unfair question. I say it because I do. I've, I've there's something. Um, <coughs> excuse me. In my first book, Claire acquires a dog, and the dog is there throughout the series. But the the acquiring of that dog is quite important to the plot in the first book, and I kind of think somebody reading the first book having read another one and realizing that she's got a dog and oh suddenly there's that dog um I wonder if that's the dog that Claire gets will sit will will think to themselves right okay there's something here so I kind of wish I hadn't done that but I I think in in book one Rowan is is particularly prickly um and she softens over time so I yes I noticed that as the series goes on yes she was very sparky and as you say prickly and and defensive um, but then I think that's life because I think we're all a bit like that when we're younger and, and you mellow as you think, oh, I'd be bothered. Um, or, yeah. you know. I, I don't know if I'd have toned that down because the, the trouble is when you start at that position, if people really like that, yeah. you can't you can't maintain that. She was really angry in book one and you can't maintain that level of anger. Yeah. <laughs> because it, it, would, it would get done so she has to grow. So yeah. it, part of me would maybe have toned her down a little bit in book one, but okay. then... I don't know if that would have, I think maybe what I would have, it wouldn't have been the same growth, but um, she definitely was, I hate this term, like, like likeable, unlikable protagonist, because I think that you don't have to be like all sunshines and rainbows to be likeable, but I think she was a bit polarizing, is maybe what I mean. Yeah, yeah. that's, that's well, probably, yes, uh, she, she was, she was definitely, you got the, the idea that there was definitely, you know, there was stuff bubbling under the surface, um, and actually, I think that's that's quite an interesting thing for a character um, and uh, providing you do do what you've done and develop them, because every character has to have their own. I'm not going to use the word journey, their character arc yeah. across the series, as well as um, within each book. Yeah, I've just um, I'm just in the process of editing book five. Uh, and in book five, I've taken her away from her normal surroundings and I've sent her up to um, Strathcarran. Uh, up in the north of Scotland so really? I've had to re so she, she's not had the normal support network there so she's had to work with police officers who are not her normal people like people like George who she's come to kind of get this like respectful George. kind of banter and, and they kind of they you know he, she still really annoys George but like that's a really really good pairing it's, it's a great partnership and it's quite a clever way to do it yeah I, you know, obviously I think... Like me, I've got police officers, so there'll always be a kind of, I mean, it, there isn't really a pairing. It's, there's a lot more happens in the real world than that. But you tend to have to buddy a couple of officers up and have them through the series. I think you've done that in a really clever way with George. Yeah, I, you know, originally when I wrote book one, George was not going to be in a, a continuing character. It was always yeah. just going to be Rowan. But as I got to the end of book one, I realised that actually into book two, she was always going to need... Yes. Somebody in an official capacity. Yeah. But I didn't, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I wasn't as brave as you. I didn't want to write a police procedural um, because I was like, uh, I, I I was, I think I was got really concerned about red tape and like getting things correct. Um, <laughs> and I wanted to have her to be able to just be a bit more rogue, I think. Um, yeah. I, I was thinking yeah. about that today, but when I knew that we were going to chat tonight and thinking that um, it, in some ways, it it Claire's more restricted than than Rowan is because she can't act outside the law. Unless, of course, you decide that you're going to make your detective one of these kind of rogue, um, excuse me, one of these kind of rogue officers who go outside the law, but it's always OK in the end. I decided I wasn't going to do that. I was going to make her more or less toe the line, more or less. She has her moments. Um, but it's... In some ways it's limiting, but in other ways it's actually quite a useful device because I think it's my job to um, get in the way of Claire detecting the crime or perhaps 
being able to prove who the, uh, or, you know, she might know who the guilty person is, but can she nail them? Um, so it's my job to put as many obstacles as I can in Claire's way and making her not able to go outside the law um, can be quite useful from that point of view. She's, she's not, able, you know, she needs a warrant. She can't just do this. She can't just do that. And in fact, is it this book? I can't remember. It is this book um, where she's investigating the death of a solicitor. And that was difficult. I didn't realise how little she would be given access to it until I, I thought I'd better check this. So it, it was a headache to start with, but it's actually a really useful plot device as well. Yeah. So I, where do you draw the line then with Rowan? Um, so I, I think her developing relationship with George has helped her to stay within the boundaries of, yeah. of what people would consider morally acceptable because she's conscious of the fact that what she does will have an impact on whether or not somebody is arrested and prosecuted. And so she she's definitely in the grey area. She definitely treads too, too far out of her, her jurisdiction in that respect, but she also does it with being forensically aware. So she always wears gloves. She has her evidence bags. You know, she... In book two, when she discovers like a, a, a crime scene and, and she does have a proper nose round, but she also does know that at this point she has to phone and, and pass it off to the authorities. So I think I get around the idea that she could just be completely untethered to any sort of, sort of moral compass or rules by the fact that by building her relationship with George because she knows yeah. that there, there's a there's a consequence of her actions and she knows as she goes on she knows a little bit more about how, how much she can push that and by not overstepping the mark she gains George's trust which means she can actually get access to more of the information that's a little bit harder for her to to get hold of so she has yeah. she can be a little bit less bull in the china shop so in book one I think she's a bit of a bull in the china shop trying to get the information that she wants Time we get to book four, she's got to that point where she's kind of accepted in in the in the kind of the police station. They they're not surprised when George brings her in or takes her her, her thoughts seriously or she mm. collects evidence. So it, it's she's she's got that kind of point now where I think she knows the boundaries, although she still does push them. Um, and she's not yeah. very good at communication, so she's not great at telling people where she's going. Mm -hmm. um, and she still does really stupid things like go to people's houses without really thinking of the consequences and, and stuff like that. So, and I quite like that because I think a police officer would be more aware. They'd be like, if I go to this suspect's house now by myself, this could go really, really wrong. Whereas Rowan's a bit like, I'm going to go. What's the worst that can happen? Um, and so she's less, mm. less conscious of, of the outcomes, yeah. becoming more so, but less conscious of the outcomes. Mm. What are your favourite types of characters to write? So obviously you've always got Claire mm -hmm. and you've always got her team. But outside of that, so when you kind of look at, you cast the net for your wider characters, what are the ones you really enjoy writing? There's a, a, a semi-recurring character who I drip in maybe every two or three books, who's a detective chief inspector um, called Tony Macaviti. And... I can't help it. I'm starting to really like him. And he's meant to be lazy and a bit sarcastic and, and um, winds Claire Sargent up a bit. There's, there's, they've got a bit of history because um, he had uh, stolen Chris's then girlfriend, who was not in the book. That was like a previous thing. And Chris had burst his nose um, and very nearly found himself on a disciplinary. Um, and... And he wanders in from time to time and he wandered into either book seven or book eight. I can't even remember now. I think I think it was book, I think it's book eight. So he's not in the one that's just come out. Um, and it's funny, I'd sent uh, the book off to my editor and uh, got the, the structural edits back. And she, she said at one point, a little comment in the side um, saying, is it wrong that I'm starting to like him? <laughs> <laughs> oh, what have I done? I've created a monster. Um, because I'd start to like him as well. I can't resist him. Um, so everybody likes a bad boy, don't they? Yeah. Um, so I quite like writing him. And then there's a character in 
a blind eye um, who is married to a gangster. And she's a sort of Polish lady who settled in Scotland. She's called Danuta. And I loved her. I just, she, she's just, I just loved writing her because she was quite sparky. And although she was married to this probably quite frightening, quite powerful man, she never lost her um, her resolve. Um, so yeah, I I think it's it's this it's the peripheral characters who wander in and then wander out again that I quite like writing. Um, I I did try to write someone who was a bit um, a bit of a thorn in Claire's flesh, and somehow he just changed his character, a sergeant called Max, and he just he just again I, I find it really hard to write nasty people who are on the right side of the law. I can write nasty villains, but I keep wanting to try and create nasty police officers. I find it really difficult and I don't know why that is. I just don't seem to be able to pull it off. Um, so I wanted to have this really superior, sanctimonious character who was based on someone who I did actually know who was a police officer and who was pretty much disliked by a lot of the other officers. And he was just so kind of superior, you know, just floating a foot above the ground, didn't just realise what a pain in the neck he was. And uh, so I introduced this character called Max, but again, he warmed his way around my heart and I made him nice. So I don't know. I don't know. I have to try really hard to write a bad police officer. Yeah. Um, but it's very difficult these days because there, I mean, obviously there's there's huge problems in the Met, but that's yeah. not one officer, that's a culture. Yeah. Um, and I'm not suggesting that that's everyone at all, but, but you know, it only takes a a, a significant minority to, to make an absolute mess of things. Yeah, um, of course. But I'd, I'd love to try and write a, re, a, a sort of rogue kind of bad officer. But I'm, I struggle with it. Um, what about you? What, what, who do you like to write? I like, I love to write morally grey characters. So ah. the people who you can be like, oh, they've done bad things, but actually maybe they've done them because their choices were this bad thing or that bad thing. Mm-hmm. Or they're, they're aware that maybe their choices were poor. Um, and so they, and they kind of have redeeming features. So I like those characters. I like to, I like to meddle in the kind of the morally grey yeah. Arias. Um I like that too. Yeah. Like Makes in, good in, reading. In book one, I've got Billy, who ends up being one of um one of Rowan's people, one of her like the ongoing cast, um, because he turns his back on his family uh in, in favor of her. But when I wrote that, when I wrote first wrote him, he was much more villainous and unpleasant. And by the time I got to the end of book one, I really liked him. Um, and I was like, I have to go back and the edit had to make him less nasty because otherwise mm-hmm. he can't really be yes it wouldn't be, credible. Really be sort of saved incredible yeah and then in book five um which will be out sometime next year probably um there's a there's a character in that that definitely has made some very poor decisions but isn't actually as bad as it, they might be uh it might be perceived and i and i really like playing with that kind of part of so way way people behave and thinking about, you know, there's all these people out there that just they're not necessarily good, they're not necessarily bad, but they're somewhere in the middle. I like that. Um, what I really don't like writing though is romance bits. I mm-hmm. I I have deliberately have had no romantic interest between Rowan and George because I didn't want it to go that way. Um, she has a bit of a romance in book three and then it fizzles out and so I, I've made a kind of a, a sort of a, a, a single Pringle um, and a lot of that is because I don't like writing romancy bits but Claire has some some romances. Claire honestly she's she, she's been a girl yes uh-huh. yeah because she's um, she left Glasgow partly because of the the gun incident but also because she, she hadn't felt supported by I think were they engaged? I can't even remember now. By this guy Tom, who was a solicitor, yeah. who had whose firm, not him, had represented the family of the boy that she'd shot, and she she couldn't forgive that. Yeah, that, um, was, that was a bit of a kick in the teeth, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but Tom, you know, just kind of really quite liked her. And then I had Tom 
get engaged and he got married and then he wandered into the last book and on his own and my editor said why is Tom back and I said I don't know it just came in I just had Claire opening the door and thought oh there's Tom on the doorstep and I planned my books I did not plan that so um I can't you know but she's settled now she's been settled for a few books now with a detective chief inspector who she encountered earlier in the series, but then she had somebody else in between times. So I'm thinking, some, somebody said to me the last time when I said something about, oh, the next book will be out soon. And they said, oh, I wonder if Claire will have a baby. I thought, oh, God. You were like, mm, I'm not sure about that. No, yeah. I, yeah, I I think that's really quite hard to to write, to be honest, the, the mm. kind of the romance relationship part. Um, and, I, and weirdly, I was thinking about this the other day, because I have a I have a friend who does a lot of beta reading for me. She's like, look, is Rowan ever going to find somebody? And I was like, no, she's going to be single forever. And I don't know if that's true, but like at the moment, and she's like, oh, but I really want her to find someone. And I'm like, no, she's just, I, I, she she likes her own space enough so much. But I, I and I, I read a lot of books where there is kind of like a, a romance element. There is like that kind of like relationship part. Mm -hmm. And I enjoy them. I just really don't enjoy writing them. Yeah. Uh, because I, I find just I find that I make myself feel awkward. Yeah, it's 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 hard. Uh, yeah, I don't like it. It's hard to get right. I was that's probably the the scenes I struggle with most. Um, if it's a like sort of relationship stuff, um, yeah. and in fact, I'm a, I'm a kind of relieved now that um, Claire and her DCI have moved in together, um, and you know we've, we've done that we don't have to kind of all simpering and Ooh, would you like to move in with me kind of thing yeah. um and I might I might I might throw a brick at that at some point just to to mess with it. I don't know I'll see how I feel I haven't planned the next one yet we'll see what happens so talking of planning you and I are, are really polar opposites when it comes yes. to this so you are the spreadsheet queen um your planning is something else How, I mean I know that you're a super organized person um but the planning do you think that you could do it without the planning or is the planning essential um I think for a police procedural it's tricky because the way I tend to write it is that try to make it as realistic as possible in that there will be more than one crime going on in the station, quite a small station. So there's more than one crime happening at the one time. And I tend to try and have them all linked, even if the link is quite a tenuous one um, in some way, because I don't want anything there that doesn't belong to, in the book. So for, for me, usually I have my major crime, um, a lesser crime and a minor crime. And they'll all be part of the one story. And so to, to kind of successfully integrate them, I think, without planning would be quite tricky. But if I was writing something different that, that wasn't so an investigative one, I don't know. Um, it might be a nice thing to try, but I do. I once on my fifth book, I changed the killer about. 40 or 50,000 words in, and that was an absolute nightmare. It had to happen because it was wrong from the start, but it was an idea that I wanted to roll with. And the further I got into it, the more I wrote, the more I thought this, this isn't right. And so there was quite, that's half a book I'd written. It's quite a lot to unpick and it had a knock-on effect. It's like, it's like, you know, Kerplunk or Jenga or something. You take yeah. one out and the whole lot collapses. And it probably took me about three goes of going through that book again to mm. pick up all of the um, things that were now didn't work, were inconsistent, didn't match the plot. So I don't think I'd ever want to do that again. Um, and I can't imagine if you were writing something and you're kept you're changing your mind or you're developing things as you go along, do you have to go back and unpick? Well, I mean, I don't think I unpick. Maybe I change or tidy up so I okay. find that the second half of my books will always be tidier 
in the in the drafting than the first half okay. because by the time I get to second half I kind of know what's going on yeah you're into um, it by then but in the first half I sometimes have to think oh actually that didn't quite pan out like that I need to to do something with that and occasionally I have to go back and take out like a, a red herring or a, a like a okay. pot because I've let I know I've left a hole I kind of go like oh um so in book five, I had I sent that to Alpha readers, and one of the and I and I knew right in my heart of hearts, I knew I'd left a, like a thread dangling, and I wondered if I could get away with it or if it would come up. But two out of the the four Alpha readers said to me, "But you didn't do anything with this. Like yeah. this this seemed important in the beginning, uh, and then it wasn't." I was like, "Well, that's because when I started writing it, it was important, uh, and then I slightly changed direction." So I know that like in that, I'm going to have to either do something with it. Or I'm gonna have to like take it out, but it's not. They're never for me. They're never huge things. They're never like okay. A lot, a lot of like major unpicking because as I as I go along and it and it starts to take shape, I can very quickly start to move that into the right the right okay. way. Okay. So as a non planner, then what do you know when you start? It depends. <laughs> So sometimes not very much, sometimes a little bit. So um, book five, I had a, a really, I, I, a kind of a, a really solid idea of what I wanted to have happen because I've been thinking about this for a while because I wanted to do a book in a different place. And so this had been on, on my mind for a bit. So I kind of had more of the, the idea formulated Um that I perhaps would normally do, but normally I've kind of got an idea of how someone's going to die, who the person's going to die. I've got like a like a hook in my mind, mm -hmm. and then I just kind of build around that. So do you know your killer. Sometimes, not always. Um, Excuse me. Yeah, not always. Uh, but I think it, it because it becomes a apparent as I build in all the bits and pieces okay and, and so sometimes what I do do I, when I go back and I do the, the second draft I'll add in some more clues in the beginning part so that oh. it, it, there's more of a, a theme I, I'd love to try it because um planning is a torturous process it really is um I love the idea of trying it but having a plan does let me sleep at night it stops me worrying about the book so, so having a plan for me was creatively kind of crippling is probably a bit extreme, but like, so my very, very first book I intended to write I had a chapter plan, I had all this stuff. And when I got to the end, I was like, yeah, I don't want to write that now, I'm bored. Um, like, because <laughs> because I, all of the kind of the creative, for me, the creative part is when I, I write the story. As soon mm -hmm. as I got to the end and it was gonna happen and I move on to the edits, I'm not in that same creative mind space anymore. I'm like in the tidy up and fix. I'm in a much more logical headspace. So if I put the creative part into the planning, it's gone, but there's nothing to actually tidy up. Mm -hmm. So I need to, I need to almost like, I suppose my first draft is almost like planning and writing simultaneously because yeah. it goes along. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but sometimes I'll do things to myself, which I find really annoying. Like um, in uh, what she didn't, no, yeah, watching TV book three, I remember thinking that that Rowan was in this woman's house and she was looking for things. And I thought, oh, I need some really big clues here. I need a couple of things. And what could she find in the post? And I was like, oh, you know what? It could be a bank statement and it could she could have withdrawn £10,000. That would be great. But that's where I stopped that writing session. The next session I came back and I was like, did she withdraw that money for? Um, and so I really was, I'd left myself this problem, but that problem turned into something that was, like quite a nice thread in the story mm -hmm. which I, I quite liked um but to answer the original question what do I know um the hook usually I know the hook okay um, yeah so like in book two Sally in the Woods I actually was in the camper van and we drove through a place in England called Sally in the Wood and I was like that would be a great name for a book and then I was like well what if you had a situation where a young girl had been found murdered at, but she was wearing the clothes of a girl that had gone missing some 12 years. I remember that. It was so, such a good hook. And and so so I had my hook. Yeah. And that's and that's then the sort of like, where do I go from there? And it's just basically kind of slapping the layers of clay on until I get something that mm. that mm. looks 
it looks like a story but I yeah I always whenever I see your spreadsheets I'm always like so much in awe I'm like I could just because I, I know that I could never write that way and so I'm always thinking god that that's that's impressive no not really I mean it's just I like spreadsheets and you know it it sort of it makes me um relax more if I have the information down I don't just use spreadsheets I use powerpoint as well yeah um do slide one slide per scene so I can drag them around and get them in the right order um I just it, it just make it makes the writing process for me more enjoyable um I love writing a first draft I hate editing I hate planning but that first draft because I've got a plan um it's just really enjoyable because then I can I can relax and have a a go at the setting and and various other bits and pieces um obviously the plan needs fleshed out but um it's it does make it more of an enjoyable process but I, I am I'm sort of intrigued by the idea that I could just start with a blank piece of paper and I I heard um Gillian McAllister um, very successful writer say that she writes her first draft and then she bins it and yeah, she writes again I know so I, I, she doesn't actually throw it away just in case but she, she says she deletes it but she does keep a copy um, the thought of that makes me but, feel slightly sick oh I can't I just I can't imagine wanting to write a book twice it's no. such a lot of work it's so many words to, to start again and I'll edit it quite happy yeah. well not happily but you know it's not my favorite thing but I'll edit it and get it better but start again but I know I, I sort of get it in that she's learning about the book as she's writing it the way exactly what you were saying yeah I, I I've heard her I've heard her say that as well and I'm always just like what I know that is just it's terrifying yeah I, I definitely that but I I what I love about writing is that we all end up with a book but how we get there Yes. It's so different. And it does and you know, ultimately it doesn't really matter whether you no. plot, plan, or somewhere in, you know, pants or you know, or whatever it, in between, as long as you get there in the end. And I I agree hundred percent. People will sometimes say to me, or 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 kind of like almost like apologize because yeah. I'm more of a planner than they are. And I think absolutely not. There's there's no glory in planning. The 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 wonderful thing is getting to the end of a book and how you get there, as you say, doesn't make it any difference. Because it's all that's just the, the the process, kind of like the of doing it, the the idea and the creating and the and the building of the worlds and the characters. That's the fun bit. We all just do it differently. Um, mm. You obviously have St Andrews, which is a big part of your book why did you pick St Andrews was it because of the police station there was it because of something else to do with St Andrews or I have a confession about the police station actually the first book that I wrote that that is buried in a hard disk and will never see the light of day again um they had moved the police station to St Andrews it used to be a very old building in North Street which is a kind of like um just all old sandstone buildings and I remember it being there for years and years and years, the blue and white police sign outside. It was a tiny station. And I wrote this whole book, whole book, with that as the police station. And there are crucial scenes where um, things taking place in relation to where the police station is. And then I just thought, I'm just gonna, you know, somebody said something about the station and the size of it. And I thought, that doesn't quite sound right. I'm just going to check that. No, it closed years ago. So that was a big mistake. The reason I chose St Andrews is partly because it's quite near my home. Um, I can travel there quite easily to have a look at it and get the feel of the atmosphere. But it also came from being a fan of uh, the Morse books and the Morse TV series because Oxford was, especially on TV, Oxford was yeah. so beautifully drawn. And I, for me, setting as a character, some people say it isn't, but I, for me it is. Um, and I, I loved just watching Morse, just for drinking in the beauty of the place. And St Andrews has always felt to me like a mini Oxford because yeah. it has the the oldest university in Scotland, I think. I think it's the second oldest in the UK, um, if not, you know, 
what is certainly one of the oldest in the world. Um, yes. It's got the golf and all the tourists, all the students, all the academics. And then there's the locals who put up with this influx of incomers every year. Um, you'll get the golf open coming to town. The Lammas Fair comes to town. It just seems to me there's so much potential there. Yeah. And, and in such a small town, which makes it a kind of a melting pot. Um, and, and that's why I, I, I thought there, there have been books Prime series already written in St Andrews, um, but I just thought I could exploit this a bit more. I think so, it doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, sorry, I cut cut across you. No, I, was gonna, I don't think it matters that there's other books written in places. To be honest, I never think that is all that important because I think everybody brings something new to that their setting. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. So you chose you you have a kind of location in mind, but you haven't used a real town name. Yes, so I think we know where your your books are. Yes, so they're, they're solidly between Kakadi and Dunfermline, Dunfermline Kakadi, whichever way around you like it. Um, which is five. Yeah, which is five. Um, primarily because when I wrote book one, I needed I needed certain things which didn't exist in Dunfermline because it did start off being in Dunfermline, mm -hmm. but I really wanted the old bus stop with multi-story car park that used to be in, in Dunfermline many moons ago when I was a teenager, and that didn't exist anymore. Um, and so I kind of like hummed and hawed and I decided that I would give myself a fictional town to give myself just a little bit of, bit of leeway. leeway, but probably it is more like, um, <clears throat> it's more like Dunfermline than Kirkcaldy, mm -hmm. uh, which will only mean to people, only to people who, are, who know Fife. Um, <clears throat> so I think you would, if you knew Dunfermline, you would know where I'm taking inspiration from, of things mm -hmm. from, but at the same time, it's surrounded by real places. So Rowan does go to a lot. Of, so she comes to Stargate Bay. She goes to, um, you know, Canby. She goes to to like up to St Andrews and there and, and other places. So that all the rest of it, the the setting is real. It's just the the town. And actually, yeah. as the books have progressed, the town has become less relevant. So in book one, it was really relevant because I needed things in certain places. Um, but as as I progress, it it has been less relevant, and so I don't know. Maybe that would be something I would have changed. I might have pushed harder to give my to to work within the confines of of actual dumb a real dumb firm mm -hmm, as mm -hmm. opposed to giving myself a fictional town. But um, it 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 served its purpose in book one. I think I thought that was going to be more necessary as I went through different stories, but it actually has become less important. Mm -hmm. um, as I've gone through, because actually these towns are not big towns, which means that she always has to travel somewhere. And yeah. I've had to fit it into the road network and like where things are in terms of distance, et cetera. Um, but yeah, I think if you I think if you knew Dunfermline, you would see and you and you've known it for a long time, you would be like, Oh, I, I know that that place is the old bus stop that used to be there, and it was there for a long time. And then they um added it, they dismantled it and put an extra bit of shopping center on and moved it uh elsewhere um back to where it had been before it'd been there actually which is weird um so yeah so so I think I think in future series I will write from a real place um but I think maybe I, I kind of will, would work harder to fit it in and I feel like you can have some leeway I think you can you can input some fictional shops and fictional places within a real town they don't actually all have to be there um I know like I, I read quite a lot of series and I think oh I know that place and I know that that thing doesn't exist in that place and you're like you can say that they, somewhere has a Nando's even if they don't have a Nando's and that kind of you know, that kind of just silly little thing um but yeah so the other thing that that I find um interesting when I read my books is there's very little drinking of alcohol in my books there's a lot of tea and coffee consumed but not hardly any alcohol and I think that's because I don't drink um not because of any like particular reason I, I just I just don't so I often think that I have to think about that I have to put those social settings in um that's like kind of a deliberate thing like going to a coffee shop or doing those things having a co coffee is all really normal but like having a glass of wine isn't and I'm always like, I know that Claire likes a, a glass of red wine. It's ridiculous. She needs to get a grip. 
do you think that um that that, 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 that kind of social element of, of what people eat and drink that kind of the norm stuff do, do you how how big a part do you think that plays in like building your character's personality and yeah like? You see, I'm, I'm, I think I'm guilty of too much. I'm, I'm far too guilty of putting the kettle on because probably like you, that's my knee-jerk reaction. You know, if I come in, if I've been out walking the dog or been to the shops, the first thing I'll do is put the kettle on to boil. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's a Scottish thing or, or if it, just I... everybody does that. But, you know, if in doubt, if I don't quite know what to do with myself, when we finish this, I will go and put the kettle on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I think I, it's... It's sometimes if I need Claire to have a conversation with someone, she'll maybe wander into the station kitchen to have a cup of tea, yeah. uh, put the kettle on or a cup of coffee. It, um, and sometimes I, I have been picked up by editors for having too many cups of tea. Um, and I, I, I think you can overdo it. I think it can it can be not quite a filler, but I think maybe there are slicker ways of doing of having that conversation without it having to be, let's have a cup of tea and talk about this. Um, yeah. So sometimes so I've got a, a kind of incident in the, the book that's just come out where Claire goes to bite into a Kit Kat, and, but she doesn't break the fingers apart. She's about to bite into the whole thing. And her two sergeants are just like horrified. And so, so there, I think that's fine because that's just a little moment. But I think yeah. for me, I need to rein in the cups of tea. And when I send her home after work, I need to stop her having a glass of wine. So it's something that I'm kind of conscious that I potentially overdo. It's a tricky balance, I think. I I, I love that you said that because my my most recent book that's coming out and, and, the, and book five, in the initial edit, both people have said to me, too much tea. Like, <laughs> like why, practically every other scene starts with tea. And I, do you know what I think that is? I think that's because, see, when I'm writing and if I'm stuck, I'll get up and go make a cup of tea. And yes. I, think all, I think almost that filters in because you're thinking... We're just living our life? lives, aren't we? Yeah, like, I, <laughs> like, what would I do now? I'd have a cup of tea. Yeah. I, if I was going to have this conversation, if I was going to, if I was going to invite somebody into my kitchen to sit down, I'd be like, you want a cup of tea? Like, and so I think that it's become almost like, almost like a placeholder because I know something's going to happen or like you say you want someone to have a conversation and having a cup of tea is a great way to do it but maybe it is a Scottish thing maybe it is just north of the border that we we have I don't know I I I don't I'm not sure but I know that I do it too much and I have been picked up for it um in some reviews as well um and somebody said about the last book because my my sergeant Chris likes to eat wagon wheel biscuits Goodness knows why, because they're vile now. They're, they used to be a lot thicker. And anyway, um, never mind. He sort of, it's a kind of running theme with him, the wagon wheel biscuits that he tries to hide from his fiance because she doesn't approve. And somebody said in a review, right, we've had the wagons wheels, we've got the Kit Kat now. Could we just stop with the biscuits? And I thought, You're like... mm, well, you know, maybe, maybe there's a point there. I maybe need to just have a little bit less wagon wheels in every book. But um, I can't, I can't, it's like Tony Macaviti, I can't help myself. You know, though, the thing is that I I read a book a while ago and through the whole investigation from beginning to end, nobody ate or drank. <gasps> there, there was not, there was not a single beer, wine, tea, coffee, anything, not a meal consumed, not even a mention of food over what I think spanned about a two week investigation these people were starved and, <laughs> and but, but to the point where I became really aware that nobody had eaten people had gone to um interview people and now offered to put the kettle on or and, and I just became really aware that that not not victim criminal or police officer had consumed anything throughout the course of this book and I was like and it was a good book but it became distracting that they hadn't actually you know uh -huh. that's so interesting them, there must be a balance. There's quite a lot of eating in my books. There's quite a yes. lot of food situations. I know, I know, I know. It's tempting. It's tempting. Um, what I can't do is make Claire eat something that I don't like. I've never done that. Always, if I'm making her a meal, I'll think, right, what would I like to eat tonight? Um, so she'll never have macaroni cheese because I can't stand it. Um, she'll never have tuna because I don't like that either. But she'll have lots of puddings and... Um, Lots of red wine. Um, Rowan eats a lot of takeaway. 
like she's a huge amount of takeaway and I think that was because that was sort of my answer to her not cooking I thought that was probably more in line with her personality although I cook a lot but she's a lot of takeaway food um but occasionally she'll cook and I remember somebody on Twitter messaged me once ago and I've just finished this scene and now what I want to do is make chili because that's what Rowan made was chili um, and I was like I don't think that's the point but okay at least you're invested that's great um <laughs> But it's quite, I think those things are quite hard. And I don't know if that's because we both have female protagonists. And so there's a little bit more domesticity to their lives mm-hmm. or because they live alone or or what it is. There's that kind of more of an element. I don't know. But yeah, like I say, I think if you have not enough, it becomes also distracting because I was yeah. so distracted by these people. Mm-hmm. who Not even at the end, did they go out for a celebratory beer or anything? I was like... Wow, that was a long time to go without any refreshment. Mm. <laughs> so yeah, I, I think that's quite hard. But there's a lot of things. Like, I mean, you take out a lot of stuff, don't you? Like, you know, yeah. uh, you never have, well, I mean, I've never had Rowan brushing your teeth and thinking about something or like occasionally you'll make reference, like if they've gone for a run, they've jumped in the shower or, or you know, got, got beaten up, whatever. But it's, there's all the kind of little mundanity that we leave out. So I think you cherry pick the bits Yes, yeah. You, in, don't you? you don't have to fill every. You don't have to follow them around every second of every day, yeah. and it's it's knowing where to put the scene breaks. For sure, I I um I sometimes think when I'm writing chapters, my chapters are really short, and I really worried about that at the beginning that my some of my chapters were incredibly short, mm-hmm. and then as I've written more books, I'm actually like, well, that's actually not a bad thing. So. I'll have maybe between 40 and 50 chapters in every book. Um, and, and, and I think that's probably more normal than, than not, because I, I quite like so. a short chapter. I love a short chapter. Um, I think one of the, the writers who does it really well is Deborah Masson. Um, some of her chapters were just like two pages, and I loved it, because you just yeah. think to yourself, just read another one. Whereas if you look ahead and it's a... 15 page chapter you might not bother you might think oh, I'm going to go to bed now or whatever but yeah. if if it's just oh there's just another cut oh yeah okay okay so I, I try to bury mine um and in fact on my spreadsheet where I have my word one of my spreadsheets where I have my word count I I have um, I use data bars to kind of signify how how you know a, a wide bar is a lot of words and narrow bars so as long as I see them going like that then I, I that's the balance I want because I like to have a uh, variation but I tend not to go over I tend not I never go over 3,000 words I think that's too much I tend to try and stick to about between 800 and 2,200 is kind of you know I'll go up to two and a half um, but I try to 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 keep them fairly short yeah I, I think I have, to have a, like I think my longer chapters usually get split in the edit because I'm like oh that's just too much. I need to yeah. I need to break that. And and for me, sometimes I think that if I have a long chapter, that's because I had a really good writing session, and that yeah. was just my brain keeping going without necessarily starting a new chapter. Would you split a chapter then if it's a long one? Yeah. Rather than rather than edit it down. Um. Or maybe I, I'll both. Edit it down if if it's if that's the right thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because I, I was talking about this with somebody else recently. I, I'm not precious about these things once I've done the creative process. So if, if I look at something and I go, oh, you know what, <clears throat> that, that page and a half adds nothing and it maybe doesn't flow, I'll be like, see you later, page and a half. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Even if it's got some of the best bit, like best bits of chat or something, I think if, it, if it's got to go, it's got to go. Yeah. Um, but often I'll find that I've, I've, I've run on to it, what should be another chapter just because of the of the writing process <laughs> and so I go actually that that's a, there's a clear chapter break there um but it I try not to I do try not to overthink it I'll think about it more in the edit I'll be like is that the nap is that the right place or have I ended on somewhere where someone could be like oh it's fine I'll just put it down and go to sleep like you say it really well that you're thinking oh I've got to go to sleep but I but I really want to know what happens next um but I think that that's that's something I've relaxed into more as I've written more books. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Do you do you think that there's things you're much more relaxed about now at this point in your series than you were 
in the beginning? Gosh, that is a good question. Uh, no, I don't think I'm more relaxed. I think I'm more of an editor as I write. So sometimes I'll write something and then I'll 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 see this kind of little editor sitting on my shoulder saying, we're taking that out. And so I take it out before it goes in, sort right. of thing. Um, so I think I've my edits as each book has gone on have become less and less work because I I I do write more thoughtfully now rather than just you know blah, vomit draft um, getting it down on the page. What's become easier? I don't know. I don't think it's I've ever I, I don't think it's ever easier. Um, but I think I probably have a bit more confidence, if that makes sense. Yeah. Ra which I suppose makes you more relaxed. So I suppose I'm probably saying the same as, as you, Angela, but I'm just, I'm always worried that this book will be the one that will not work. Every single book. And the more you write, I think the more you worry about that because you think I've used up all my good ideas now. <laughs> I don't yeah. know where the next one's coming from. Although they seem That's to. That's the thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 I think if, if I ever get to the stage where I think the series isn't fresh, then I hope I have the wisdom to stop. But um, I suppose that's what editors are for. Yeah, I, I think that was one of the reasons in book five I've taken Rowan somewhere else. Yes, that's I, a good, I mean, good, good plan. I just, I just wanted to give her a different scenery and kind of mm -hmm. lean into that a bit more to try and give some some freshness. And I'll, I'll return her back to Cuddy Ford for book, um, for book six, which is fine. Um, but I'm always thinking because I gave myself this dual timeline with most of my books, where there's always a historic crime and a current one. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't necessarily my intention to do that. It's just that that's how books one, two, and three kind of happen. So I feel like it's become a theme. Um, so I'm it's almost a bit like Unforgotten, isn't well, it? I, mean, I would love it to be like Unforgotten, to be honest, because <laughs> that's amazing. But I don't think, um, I don't think I'm quite there. But I, I think, yeah, I, I because I, and I love that program. It's probably one of my favorite. Oh, me too. I think it is my program. favorite. I, and when, as a total sidetrack, when they came out with this series and, you know, that we had this big cat cast change, I was so apprehensive because I was like, can they, can this be pulled off without? I thought they did it superbly. Oh, they did it so well, but I, I, really going into, I was so nervous. I thought that was such a brave thing because that could have been the end of that, of that program, yeah. but they did it in such a way that it wasn't and and you know um the first time I watched Unforgotten I don't know where my, my husband was because we had to watch things together but I had just seen it thought, I'll watch this and by about 20 minutes and I was like oh he'll really like this so I made myself yeah. stop watching it and we literally it must have been during like the first lockdown I think in 2020 um we literally binge watched the entire series I think we stayed up to about four in the morning watching this because it was yes. so compelling and so I think I watched probably about three series over a fortnight because it, I just couldn't get enough of it. And I, I'll tell, what I think it is, it's obviously there's the great partnership with Sunny and first yeah. of all Nicola Water and then Sinead Keenan, was it? I think so, yeah. Yeah, something like that. Um, but it's the other three in the team, you know, the older guy and the, the girl with the red hair and the other girl, they're just so normal. And that's yeah. what I love about it. They're so ordinary. They're like people you pass in the street. They're not yeah. mad. They're not, they don't all have huge hang-ups and, and issues that that um come into the program. They're just so quiet. And yeah, I think that's that it's whole, a quiet program. I was gonna say the whole program is quite quiet though, and it's yes. like that kind of like intenseness that it feeds into. Though that's the sort of thing that when I sit down and write, I think if one day I could write something as good as that oh. then I would be so satisfied me too, um, me too. that's kind of always the aspiration isn't it that you it's you... it's just beautiful it, it's a it's just a gem of a program 
Oh, it's, it's amazing. I absolutely love that program. And it's funny because I remember years and years ago thinking, oh, I'd love to write something criminal mindsy. But actually, when I started to, to really put some effort into, into writing, I realized that wasn't what I wanted to do because that's that was a little bit too grim. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, if if one day I was I I could sit back and I thought I've written anything to that to a sign of undergone, I would be deliriously happy and I would yeah. be it's a I it's think, a little gem. I love it. I think I have made it. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I love that. Um the other thing I was gonna say to you is because writing in Scotland, obviously there's a lot of Scots language, like and Fife is quite has its own slight dialects all around the place. I know that I try and put little bits into sentences when it's appropriate for the character that anybody who was not from Scotland could still pick up and read and follow the sentence, but it can be quite hard, that balance, to get yeah. the kind of character-building words without yeah. dipping like, into something that becomes much harder for a wider audience. or an I think it can audience. become clunky if you overdo it. Um, I so I'll um, I'll have some Scottish words um, that will be accepted words, as opposed to sort of contractions like dinny and goni and um, stuff like that. And if I'm having a character who uh, might speak in the dinny goni way, then I'll give them maybe two or three words. And the rest that, that they're allowed to use like that, and the rest of the words will be English words, but their their dialogue will be different because um, dialogue can tell you a lot about character. Yeah. Um, and I'll sometimes find that I'll change what they say to avoid doing too much of it because, a bit like you know the the start of train spotting. I think it can get exhausting if you're wading through a lot of that if you're not Scottish. Yeah. And although I want my books to be grounded in Scotland, I want them to be accessible to people that that aren't used to listening to Scottish people speaking. Um, I, I think that's that part, it's that accessible part, and you want to make sure mm -hmm. that there's enough English words in there that you can you can know what those words mean, even mm -hmm. if they seem yes, the context, like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Or, or they're just derisions of like. Whereas, like, ooh, instead of out, and you know, like, you just change little bits and pieces. Mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. I, I know that sometimes I think the, the the very first book I ever wrote, which also will never see the light of day, that was very, very fife. There was a lot of, of, and now looking at it, whilst there were some bits where, where all right, I think that was too much. Uh huh. It, it was it was true and genuine to the way. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. And, and and from and the people who I was showing, but if you came at that from a, a completely non non no knowledge of that sort of spe speech, you would have found it hard. And I think when I I look back at that, that was probably one of my big writing mistakes. I was mm -hmm. too too authentic to that speech, yeah, so I'm really yeah. conscious of it now. Yeah, I think I mean the the one that I always think about is um, I grew up in Dundee, and in Dundee, a uh, roundabout is called a circle. Um, so you know you speak about the Kingsway Circle, Scott Five Circle, um, but that really doesn't happen anywhere else. Even even yeah. in the surrounding areas, um, nobody would call a roundabout a circle. So um, I I would never. Oh, would I put it in a book? If I put it in a book, it would have to be explained. Claire would have to say, what? Do you mean a yeah. roundabout? Um, or that sort of thing. Otherwise, nobody would get it unless you're from Dundee. And that's the um, thing. I think you don't want to constantly be explaining what things no, mean. No. Um, I, th I think you don't want to constantly be doing anything like no. that. So, yeah. Because again, it's, it's like that info dump part, isn't it? Where you, you, you are going oh I have to pause the story to explain to you this yes yeah yeah, yeah absolutely and it gets just... it gets in the way of it, it interrupts the pace yeah so yeah I it, yeah I think light touch as with the food and and everything else um light touch is the is the, the trick yeah I, I definitely I definitely think that that's the case I am um, I think so I'm I'm I've written book book four is out in a couple of weeks. Um, and 
book five will come out probably where are what month is this? this is this is august we're in august so i'm hoping probably maybe january or february book five, wow. five but obviously i've been in rowan's world a long time and you've been in claire's world a long time how do you think you would feel if you decided to write a different series or a standalone do you how do you think that that would be kind of like a bit of a, a jolt or do you think because you've got you know eight books seven out but eight on on eight kind of under your belt that what you've learned from that would make writing a complete new set of characters easier or harder I think it would make it easier because I've learned a lot about the publishing process and the writing world and publishing world and how things work and what's required and what's not required um I think a standalone would be easier than another series because if you're writing a standalone then there's no expectation of returning to that world so yeah. you don't need to think about it enduring beyond the end of the book and that your characters will will have to have an arc across the series yeah so I think the hardest thing would be a new series and I sort of always have in the back of my mind as I was saying earlier the fear that I'll get to the stage where I'm writing the same book again and readers will sort of say, or my editor will more than likely say, you know, I think we've reached the end here. Yeah. And I would be okay to walk away from the Claire series, I think, although I'd miss it. But I probably wouldn't kill her off, I don't think. Don't know, spoiler alert. Um, because I might one day want to come back to it think what yeah. I might do if I wanted to seriously pause the series would be to send Claire somewhere else or have her take a leave of absence or I'm not sure. Um, and I love the idea of starting another series, but I now know that there's such a lot of work in building that world to make sure that it's got legs for a yeah. series. Um, I don't So, what, what do you think about... You're you're talking about books five, six. So I, I always think with Rowan, I'll keep going all the time. I've got ideas that, that suit her and her situation. But I also have, I, I have started to have ideas that wouldn't suit Rowan and, and that probably do need a police procedural, which is the one thing I said when my partner didn't write. Um, so that, I think, is something I would like to explore in the next sort of six to eight months but yeah the idea of writing a different a different series with different characters does does kind of give me a bit of trepidation because there's I'm in my comfort zone with Rowan like I know all yeah. the people I know how they're going to interact with one another um but it, it's also that part you're talking about like where do you come into the the interactions like is your is your main detective new is that uh, how are you just going to walk in and it's established um so yeah I I I think because my first ever book was a police procedural um and there were a couple of characters in there that I just absolutely loved and I've always been looking for an opportunity to resurrect them into some into give them a new lease of life because they were just they were just so enjoyable to write and you know, there was they had. I, I would take kind of like a, a, a grim humor, sort of that that way that I imagine that police do in order to to coat themselves from some yeah, of the, the black the, humor, the reality of, of what they deal with. That kind of black humor um, that I really enjoyed writing. But I in and I and I wrote that book in 2015, so it was a really long time ago. But there's there's definitely one specific character that's kind of just lingered with me that I would like to find find him a new home. Um, and just recently I've had a couple of ideas that could only be investigated by an active police person because you have to write this. I'm I'm intrigued already one. now. So yeah, so and and I've come up I, I don't know if you find this, but like I find that when I'm in a really creative mood or place. I had loads of ideas. So, so a lot of my ideas came to me when I was on Holly and Sky, just relaxing and doing other things. And I was like, so I, I now have pro I have sort of like three thoughts, three plans that might might happen in the next little while. But obviously it takes a while to write a book. Um so they're on they're on to do this. But yeah, I, I'm definitely open to the idea of, of more open than I've ever been of, write, of writing a police procedural. Excellent. Um, 
Oh, I look forward uh, to that. Uh, maybe, but this time I'll absolutely do it in a real place. So <laughs> if I do it this time, it'll be done from them. Um, and I and I and I know where the police station is. I drive past that. <laughs> um, I I I was inside it a really long time ago, and I doubt it's changed very much. Um, but I can I, I I'm happy with sort of blagging what the inside of a police station looks like. Um, what I said I was inside it was for purely non criminal related <laughs> activities. We I, I I'm a qualified nurse trainer and we went there um, to hear a talk about child protection. Um, so I I wasn't being arrested. Just to be clear, uh, yeah, she says that she says that. Really <laughs> That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Um, but yeah, so I don't know. Maybe maybe. In a year's time, I'll be talking about the police procedural Exciting. series. Exciting. Oh, I can't wait. That started, so we'll, we'll see. We'll see. I never say never. But yeah, I am. Um, and on that note, I, it, it's been an absolute pleasure um, chatting oh, to you. I've had and such I, a lovely time. Thank you so much for I, asking me. And I could keep on chatting to you for hours quite happily. Um, and I think... I think, see, when you get into the nitty gritty of chatting about books, I could keep going for ages. So I'm just really, really grateful because I know that um, you are just getting over being a bit poorly. So I'm really, very grateful for you being on um, and having a chat. And the I'll be sharing this with um, people on my social media. So on the 11th of August, which is when Lie She Didn't Tell uh, comes out. So I'll be able to pre-order now and for Kindle. And it'll be available on Kindle Unlimited and paperback on the 11th of August. So Lovely. Buy um, it. Just buy it. Yes, absolutely. Buy, buy my book. And pre-order. If you have the other ones, <laughs> buy them all. Uh, yeah, so pre-order is available um, and it'll drop onto your Kindle, which I love a pre-order because it does that. Oh, uh, pre-order is so yes. wonderful. So, well, thank you so much for, for chatting. I really, really enjoyed it. I can't wait to read the book. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Okay, so... Thank you everyone for, for watching and um, I'll be dropping in some more of these videos throughout the day uh, so you can catch them throughout and they will also be uh, available on my social media channels so you can get them at a later date if you didn't see them this time. Thanks everybody. Bye. Bye.